Welcome to today's webinar, What We Need to Know About Brexit Straight from the Source, with our very special guests, John Bruton and Christian Noyer, and we hope that Stéphane Dering can join us a little later. This event is organized by the European American Chamber of Commerce New York, where Europeans and Americans connect to do business. My name is Yvonne bendinger Roche, and I'm the Executive Director of the EACC, and I will be your host for today's event. Before we get started, I would like to thank our partners, the Consulate of Germany, Ireland and Belgium in New York, as well as Enterprise Ireland and Flanders Trade and Invest for supporting this program today. And in this context, we are joined today by Wolfram von Heinitz, the Deputy Consul General of Germany in New York. Germany currently holds the EU presidency and we will invite Mr. von Heinitz to give us some introductory remark to set the stage for the discussion. With that, I hand over to you, Wolfram. Thank you very much, Yvonne. And thank you very much for the European American Chamber for organizing this excellent event. We have really an excellent high profile panel. You could be very proud of getting these people here together, Christian Noé and John Bruton, and we hopefully will be joined by, uh, by Stefan also, but we see. But even more, I would congratulate to the timing because it could be a better week. It's a decisive week. It's actually a decisive day. Uh, even so, that's hard to say, but let's say better. It's one of the decisive days and one of the decisive weeks. So it is actually high tension. High tension, why? Well, because these negotiations are different from other negotiations. Normally, when diplomats negotiate about something, they negotiate about a plus a new agreement that increases strengths in relations. This is basically more an exercise in damage control because whatever will be the outcome of the negotiations, it will be less than the status quo that we have before. So we have to mitigate basically the damage and we hope we will achieve that to have a result that is as close as to the relation we have now in the future. Why does it matter for transatlantic relations in particular? Well, first of all, it will have an effect of transatlantic trade and also transatlantic travel. But it's more than that. It has an effect on the situation in Northern Ireland, the peace agreement with Northern Ireland, which the, Amer the US played a major role in, and which is observed from this side of the Atlantic very closely as well. But there is more. We jointly, and this became quite obvious in the US elections, afterwards we face a lot of global challenges today, climate change or the rise of China, just to mention two. And we will only be able to tackle those uh, challenges if we stay together, if we work together with those countries that share our values at the core of the Western values community, I would say, is the transatlantic community. So. This is another thing. And then there's also one philosophical question, I would say. Brexit actually poses a lot of questions what sovereignty means in these days. If it is still the nation state that should have sovereignty, or if we happen to shift to a broader model, how you define sovereignty. Also a question that has been very obvious in the discussions in the election campaign in the US, and that has a parallel with the Brexit. And so we will see how these questions are answered. Let me clear say from a German perspective what are our objectives, and I would say we have three priorities. First of all, implement the exit agreement. The exit agreements, including its part relating to uh, uh, the Irish question, basically, but all parts. We already have an agreement on the exit, so this must be implemented. Secondly, keeping a partnership with the UK as close as possible in all areas. I said in the beginning it will be less, but it's essential from our perspective that we keep, keep the relations between the EU and Britain as close as possible, including areas like cyber security, like security, the whole way actually it is very essential that we cooperate closely. And I've seen that that is also in the interest of the UK, of course. And the third objective from the German perspective is, of course, to strengthen and to keeping together the, the internal market of the EU, even if one member leaves, basically. And that is even more important, as now the EU has made massive steps forward just in the recent months in the reaction to COVID, in 
securing vaccine distribution inside the EU, securing equipment for dealing with the crisis, but also in the reaction and the economic reaction in the period after the crisis, in the economic recovery, really resourcing money from joint funds of the EU is, is a really breakthrough. It's a new step forward. And so one part of the Brexit negotiations is also not only safeguarding what we have from the relations we already established with the EU, but how can Britain as much as much possible participate in the future progress that the EU is achieving. So I think that we shouldn't forget without being able to, to stop or slow down the progress the EU is achieving, of course, but of course, we not only want to safeguard as much as possible on the excellent relations we have with the EU, with Britain, but we also want to safeguard that they participate in every progress we make in the EU as much as possible, but that's up to the UK of course to say how much they want. With that, I will finish my introductory remarks and this very broad overview why it matters also in the transatlantic relations and I hand over to you, John, John Foley, the Reuters um, Breaking News US editor. John had also previous positions, I think, in Asia, but more important for today, also you were running the European Bureau, I think, between 2015 and 2017. So you're also an expert on European affairs and on transatlantic affairs. Well. Over to you, John, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank, um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, well, um, I wouldn't necessarily say that I feel like an expert at the moment on European affairs, um, given how rapidly things are changing. And I would say that, you know, November really is proving to be a nail biter. We made it through the US election, talks on Brexit are really, really now down to the wire, um, almost four years since the negotiations started. And of course, as you may have seen, um, just a few minutes ago, uh, we learned that one of the negotiators on Michel Barnier's EU team has tested positive for COVID-19, which is why uh, Stefan de Rink, who is going to join us today and who is Mr. Barnier's uh, uh, basically chief chief aide and number two in the negotiations, um, is otherwise engaged right now, but hopefully um, may be able to join us briefly later. But uh, do not fear because I have two fantastic experts who are here. Um, and they are going to give us their insights on Brexit and, and where we go next and how to make sense of the very rapid pace of news and change in this whole situation. Um, so just, I'll give you a super quick introduction. Um, John Bruton is, as you all know, the former Taoiseach of Ireland uh, and also the uh, former EU ambassador to the United States. Uh, so he knows the transatlantic relationship intimately. Uh, Christian Noyer um, is the former governor of the Bank of France. Um, and he's also uh, a former first vice president of the ECB, uh, an expert on finance and central banking, and also France's point person on Brexit. Before we kick off, I just want to uh, reiterate what Yvonne said, which is that you should please feel free to ask questions while we go along. Um, we, will, we will see, hopefully, some of those questions come through and I can feed them into the conversation. So please do not wait till the end to ask your questions. Uh, we want to hear from you. Um, and with that, I will just kick straight off, if you don't mind. Um, uh, Christian, I'm going to start with you because you're on my left. Um, just to, can you help us, get, help us get a sense of looking at this from your, from your position? How would you characterize where we are in the talks, notwithstanding today's unexpected um, disruptions? How, how would you characterize those talks? And, and for those of us watching from the outside, what, what's your perception of what still remains to be done? Um, in in, in my view, <clears throat> the, the, I mean, what, what is uh, seeked for both by the EU and the UK is really uh, <clears throat> to have a free trade agreement in the field of, of, of traditional trade. That is what I would call the WTO universe. And we know that uh, uh, most of uh, the things that have to be discussed and agreed upon uh, uh, are more or less agreed at this point, but there are a, a, a few very difficult points. One is fisheries, but we may expect that a solution might be found out. Uh, another one, I mean, after all, we have an agreement with Norway, we could uh, uh, probably have something with the UK. Uh, it must be known that there is uh, an intertwining extremely strong uh, inside Europe between the UK and, and the continent. For instance, uh, 
uh, not only uh, fishers from France or Spain or the Netherlands go to UK waters, but the reverse is true. Uh, fish that is being prepared in in uh, in uh, uh, plants in the UK are exported to uh, countries on the continent. So if you disrupt the chain, uh, I mean, there's a lot of problems, including for the UK. Uh, a lot of jobs would be would be lost. Uh, and problems in the in in, in the food chain uh, would be at, at all points. So there must be a solution. Uh, we have uh, a problem with the rules of competition and the fair competition and the governance of the agreement. And of course, the issue of Ireland, which is politically absolutely key, we have to make sure that what has been agreed is uh, basically uh, remains uh, remains. Uh, uh, in the uh, uh, valid. Now, if we look, well, that's the WTO universe and the and the trade universe. If we look at the financial industry, it's different because there we are not in the WTO universe. Uh, <clears throat> we are in in a field which is extremely strongly linked to uh, to the the internal market and the internal market, as we call it, uh, it's. It's really the capacity to uh, uh, to have a free access for all actors to all internal market uh, parts uh, without any any uh, presence in in various countries, and that is linked to the fact that we have the same regulations and the same judge to judge on the regulations and the same regulators or uh, uh, European agencies to coordinate the regulators uh, when there is no single regulator. So, uh, of course, the UK stepping out and saying clearly, we don't want to be uh, uh, to be just rule takers and we do not want to follow the court of the European Court of Justice uh, to be submitted to the Court of Justice. Uh, we want to be free. Then, of course, they themselves decided to get out of the internal market and therefore uh, for the financial industry there can be only very few uh, uh, domains where uh, equivalents for instance or a, a few international rules may help London to continue to provide some services at least indirectly but the bulk uh, is being transferred or has already been transferred or is going to be transferred in the next few weeks. So before I hand over, I want to hand over the same question to you, John. But um, first, if I can, Christian. You, so you mentioned fishing, and fishing has been sort of one of the themes of this year's Brexit negotiations. But fishing is, and this always amazes me, even though I am British, but I watch this from obviously from New York. Fishing is tiny, right? It's, it's a tiny industry for Britain. It's a fairly tiny industry for France, and certainly the bit of the French industry that fishes in British waters is. We're talking potentially three thousand people who are employed directly. How can such a small industry have become such a huge part of these discussions, especially when finance, for example, which employs literally a million people, I think, in the UK and, and no doubt a similar number in, in France, has almost been um, sidelined by this question of what to do with fishing rights. How should, do, how should we make sense of this? Because, the, because France, France and Britain are the two main parties to that area of disagreement so far. I suppose uh, I, I suppose that it it appeared as a symbol of the capacity to bring back sovereignty, and they said, uh, I mean the, the the lobby said, well, if we get back sovereignty, we may accept every year to give some quotas, but that's going to be negotiated. We don't want to be subject to a rule where our waters are just open. By the way. Uh, there are some British fishermen who come to French waters to get scallops, for instance. So it goes both ways. But it's true that more are going from the continent to uh, to Britain. But um, there is just a, what, what needs to be done is to find out uh, a solution that would uh, save face uh, for for Britain and uh, uh, but not change much uh, not too much uh, of, um, uh, of of what is actually done because as i said the industry is so much intertwined that it's in, in the end the interest of everybody to um uh to to find an agreement in my view got it and, got it. and you think by the way you, you think that a deal on that is close you started off by saying you think that's achievable well i'm not 
<clears throat> in the negotiations, but I would be surprised that it would be the blocking uh, uh, factor in the end. Got it. I think nobody's in the negotiations <clears throat> at the moment. Um, so, John, if I can ask you some of the questions. So, how do you how do you see the progress that still remains to be made? Because um, obviously, the Northern Ireland and, I and the relationship between Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland and the UK has just been pivotal to, to, to much of the discord and I just would be interested to know how far you think we've come and how far we've stopped to go. Well, the Irish issue has been re rendered much more acute and much more difficult by the provisions of the Internal Market Bill, which uh, the current British government succeeded in having passed through the House of Commons, but which uh, is getting into difficulty in the House of Lords. Uh, and this uh, enabled the British government, gave them the power which they would normally have to break a treaty, the withdrawal treaty, that they had agreed barely 12 months previously, which provided uh, for the checks on the compliance of goods entering Ireland, which might go on to the rest of the European Union, taking place not on the Irish border, but at sea in between the island of Britain and the island of Ireland. So that was what was agreed by Boris Johnson in the Withdrawal Treaty, and he then sought the power to go back on what he agreed. Now, this was seen, I think, by most people as a most unusual act of bad faith on the part of uh, the British government. But what it brings to light, really, in my view, is that Brexit is an emotional issue. It's an issue of the imagination it's an issue of metaphysical concepts like sovereignty, rather than a practical issue. If this was just a practical issue and it was a question of splitting the difference between two competing interests, the problem would have been solved long ago. But it's all instead about perception, how Britain can present to itself the notion that it has, quotes taken back control of things that apply in British sovereign territory, whether that be at sea in the case of fish or on land in the case of all other activity. And it's about this metaphysical concept of absolute sovereignty. And it's important to say that sovereignty is a British idea. It goes back to the English Civil War of the 17th century, where Parliament asserted that it was sovereign and that the king was not sovereign. And they fought a civil war about that. Parliament won, but subsequently the king came back. And this issue of parliamentary sovereignty, sovereignty has been an obsession of the Anglo-Saxon world. Uh, to be found in the United States, to be found in Britain, but not to be found in the same way in other places. In other, in other places, in continental Europe and in Ireland, we understand that if you have international agreements on almost any subject, they are going to limit your sovereignty to some extent. And you sometimes can increase your sovereignty by joining together with other countries so that you have sovereignty in that respect over a wider area, or you can restrain your sovereignty and only confine what you're sovereign to, to your own territory, in which case you don't have international agreements with other countries. But it's, it's a shifting, uh, constantly being renegotiated contract that a country, country makes with other countries. That's the way we see it in Ireland. That's the way it's seen, I think, in the European Union. It's not the way it's seen in Britain. And I think if there is an agreement, uh, Boris Johnson is going to have quite a difficult job convincing some of his backbenchers who are convinced that absolute sovereignty is attainable he's going to have difficulty convincing some of those people that whatever agreement he makes meets this requirement of completely taking back control. Uh, and I, I'm afraid it's going to come down to a political judgment. Does he, is he prepared to pay the price uh, to have an agreement and disappoint some of the absolute supporters of sovereignty? Or is he, on, on, on the other hand, going to say, well, I can make more political progress in Britain 
by waiving the Union Jack and even if it's going to involve considerable hardship, I will be seen never to have let uh, those ultra Brexit tears down. So that's that's the political judgment he's going to make. Of course, all of the issues that Christian has referred to will have to be uh, resolved. But if it was only those issues that had to be resolved, I think we would have had an agreement a year ago. The final remark I would make is we agreed that there would be time limits imposed on any negotiation in respect of a country leaving the European Union. In fact, we did that in the Treaty of Lisbon. I think we're now seeing with COVID-19 and the way it has slowed down the practice of diplomacy, that these time limits were inappropriate and ill-advised. And I, I wonder, are we going to have to find some way of blurring some of the time limits or extending some of the time limits by whatever legal means we can find. Because one thing we don't want is an agreement that's badly drafted, where we don't know what it means because it was made at four o'clock in the morning by people who haven't had a, a, a moment's sleep for 48 hours. That sort of an agreement uh, is full of risks. So, actually, I think there, there's, lots, there's lots to build on from that, but I want to focus on the last thing you were talking about there, which is the timing. Um, because the, we went into this week with high anxiety, I think, over what would happen if a deal weren't struck within the next few days. I know that Simon Coveney, the Irish Foreign Minister, had said, you know, we, we're in real trouble, I think this is exact words, if we don't have a deal in the next seven to ten days. Um, obviously, the negotiations are currently on pause, which makes that even harder to achieve. I think the part of the European Parliament, which needs to ratify deal, is due to sit two more times before the end of the year. I guess that can be potentially um, changed. But what? But at the same time, we have these messages like I think the I think um, Gardas Dombrovskis, who's the, um, the Vice President of the Commission, said, you know, the one date we can't move is January the first. Um, how? I mean, is that really true? Because it seems it seems to me that if we don't start talking about moving that date or or doing something to extend the a new transition period, it's going to be chaotic, even if there is a deal. Um, Christian, I don't well, know if you want to... Well, the, 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 the problem is that the European Union uh, is a system of rules. Uh, and that's <clears throat> its great strength, but it's also its great <coughs> rigidity. Uh, and I think it could be, it is very difficult to see uh, how we can extend the limit. It's there in the treaties. The procedure for making an amendment to the treaties are extremely cumbersome. Uh, and I, I don't know how we're going to get around this. Um, and I, 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 I just, I, I'm quite worried about it, I have to admit. Do you think, um, do you think, do you think companies are ready for not just a no deal, but for a deal. I saw that uh, the chief executive no. of a trade association of Northern Irish no. manufacturers, right, said they're no. Not. So. They're not ready at all. And the reason they're not ready is, of course, they don't know what to get ready for. Because until there's an agreement, until there's an agreement, they don't know what they're going to be dealing with. So the preparations will be different depending on the shape of the agreement. Now, here you have uh, direct conflict, if you like, between the uh, brinkmanship of the political negotiators on the one, one hand, who want to get to the very last minute uh, in the hope that if they can be the one that hangs out to the very last minute, they may get a slight advantage. Their interests run completely counter to the interests of business, who want certainty and they want it yesterday. Christian, how do you think about this? I mean, the sound of the financial sector certainly doesn't seem to be ready. <clears throat> well, the financial sector uh, knew, uh, has, has known for several years now that they would have to uh, to make big changes. Uh, the, the 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 legal part of the changes, at least for all the the big firm, big groups and medium-sized groups, uh, are in place. Uh, they've been done uh, um, relatively early. Uh, now, what is a bit late because of the uh, pandemic uh, events uh, is the actual transfers of people because it was difficult during the course of this year uh, to move so many people. So, for instance, uh, 
there are uh, many firms that uh, had the intention to move, who had moved, which had moved uh, part of their staff uh, uh, last year or at the very beginning of this year, and were uh, preparing to uh, to move uh, uh, all the teams during the summer. Um, uh, for for schooling reasons, when there are families, and this has proved uh, difficult uh, to to um, to prepare that during spring, and they uh, they were uh, uh, willing to do that towards the end of the year. So still, still plan to do that uh, during the end of the year, being actively to move around Christmas uh, several hundred staff, but that's. That's not easy. Uh, so the situation complicates uh, things a little bit. Uh, in the in the domain of uh, of banking, uh, the ECB, as the chief regulator in the, in the EU, has clearly given a roadmap to everybody, and the roadmap extends largely uh, or partly in 2021. So to give an example, in uh, uh, broker dealer activities, uh, what is uh, uh, what has been uh, uh, um, uh, asked by the ECB is that by the end of the year, before the 1st of January, all the sales uh, are in place and part of the uh, risk control and compliance uh, teams. Uh, but the trading activities can be moved progressively next year. Uh, so, and in the meantime, there will be back-to-back -back operations. Um, in, the, in the field of asset management, uh, there will be, uh, well, initially uh, uh, it's, it was mostly legal entities uh, uh, managing funds from an administrative point of view, but the reality of management could remain in London. But the, uh, uh, the instructions of the, of the ESMA, the European regulator, is that progressively a bulk of the management, not everything, it's typically uh, a, a domain where you can have funds managed in the US and sold in Europe and the reverse, but it cannot be 100% uh, managed elsewhere. You need to have uh, uh, all the, the basic activities. So that, that will be done progressively. Uh, and, and so I expect that to be done relatively smoothly with some difficulty around the turn of the year. And what we see now is a second wave uh, of, uh, of the transfers in the, in the banking sector and uh, an acceleration of, of uh, transfers in the asset management sector. Uh, that's, that's very key. I just say on, on the asset management issue, I know that in, certainly in Britain there was, a, there was uh, some consternation about the status of the asset management industry a couple of years ago. There was a, a, a perception that there was, um, and these are not my words, but that there was a friend, an attempt at a French land grab um, to move that industry, which is obviously quite large, um, over to Europe through these rules about delegation. As you say, the idea that you can have, you know, set up a fund in one place but manage it from another. So it sounds like what you're saying, like and you may not agree with the concept of a land grab, but it sounds like you're saying that it is an inevitability that that industry is then going to move more to Europe? Um, it, it's clear that, well, in the banking sector, it's, it's very clear. The ECB has said, I want to see all the, uh, all the chain of activities and be able to check from a regulatory point of view and supervisory point of view, how you're doing everything. Uh, so you need to have, for instance, a bulk of trading in the EU. Uh, but to take examples, I mean, if a bank says, okay, I'm bringing my uh, dealing room for euro operations, and I'm transferring all the euro operations for the entire world uh, to, uh, to, the, to a, my place in the, the place I've chosen in the EU, uh, but I would like to continue to have back-to-back -back operations and do the trading for, I don't know, the Australian dollar in, in London, because having two dealing rooms for the Australian dollar, that doesn't make sense in the same time zone. And that, yes, the ECB will say, of course, that's, that's natural. And there can be several examples like that. Uh, so that, that's the kind of thing that, that, that makes sense. Uh, in the domain of asset management, uh, the UK has made reference, for instance, with, to the CETA agreement that we have with, with Canada. 
And there, there is equivalence for management of funds. What does it mean? It means that you can sell in Europe funds that are managed in Canada, for basically invested in Canada, and sell in Canada funds which are managed in the EU, in the EU for European uh, uh, investments. Uh, and that's that's fine, and we can continue to do that. And we, we could do the same with the with the UK, and that's natural. What we want to avoid is that we just have, uh, 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 you know, um, platting uh, uh, activities or uh, um, uh, just brass brass uh, uh, plates in in the EU. And the, and the the entire activity being done as well, because then there is no possibility to check whether the regulation is followed, the supervision is followed, uh, and how the risk management is organized. So we need to have a bulk of activities here to be able to, and that's what all regulators in the world would, would like to have. Uh, but it does not mean that we want 100% of the activity uh, to be moved in the in the, in the you uh, for all products sold to the to, to uh, EU clients. I mean, the, it's there that uh, um, equivalence uh, is a good concept, but it should not be uh, used for for uh, I mean uh, turning around uh, the the uh, uh, the need to, uh, uh, to to have a reality of activity here to be able to uh, super. I said, I mean, all those things are uh, extremely important from, from, from the point of view of financial uh, 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 stability. And we've seen that during the crisis of 2008, 2009, when you have no capacity to follow uh, what is being done by the, by the actors. There is a big risk uh, the, day, uh, the day you are confronted with a, with a big shock. And especially for activities in Euro, uh, because then the the only uh, entity that can step in when there is a big crisis is the central bank. And if the central bank has not been able to have any view on what's going on uh, on its in, in on investments in its currency and is suddenly asked to step in, uh, that, that's a real problem because they would do that in a blind way. So where is the, just sort of following on, on the financial sector question, where is the new, where is the hub going to be? Like, where, like we, we've seen banks moving, banks and financial funds moving assets to Frankfurt, to Paris, um, you know, where is, I know this is an old question, but it's sort of like, Kind of answered which will, which city will be Europe's financial hub and where are most people moving to? Firms are moving um, to a number I, of I think we don't, I mean, we, we power, do not need to have, uh, to have uh, specific agreements in that field. Uh, we need uh, the, uh, the, the um, uh, I mean, the, the EU has decided already uh, to give equivalence uh, in, in, in fields where it was in the short term the clear interest of the EU because there was no uh, alternative uh, to London, for instance, in the, in the clearing uh, sector uh, for some of the big contracts which are uh, done, uh, um, done in London, uh, which uh, are in London and uh, uh, without, without equivalence. Uh, without uh, an equivalent in the, in the EU, uh, with the idea that uh, it, those contracts are so important for financial stability that at least part of the business should come over time in the EU, but uh, not not in the very short uh, time. So we, we gave uh, uh, the European Commission gave an equivalence agreement for 18 months, and, and we'll see. I mean, it might be slightly longer than that. Um, uh, in in the in other um, financial market platforms, most of them have created uh, uh, an a, a second platform in the EU. Some of them are in in Paris, like uh, Akisa Exchange or or TPI Cap. Uh, some of them are in Amsterdam or, or elsewhere. Uh, as I said, the, the, all, all the the important Groups have 
entities uh, in the in the EU, and have started to transfer uh, the the teams that they need. Things are going relatively smoothly. I do not expect uh, specific difficulties, uh, um, in the, and that the 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 pace at which things will continue to move, uh, hopefully. Uh, bit by bit and nicely will be will be uh, managed by the regulators. Got it. Thanks. Um, let's give you a wide fire rest for a minute, Christian. John, how do how does how do you see this from from Ireland? I know you were you were just saying that there are multiple venues um, to which uh, companies are moving assets and people. The, the, these will be decided on a case by case basis by the individual uh, banks and financial institutions. What EU location? Is most suitable to them. Some are moving activities in both the asset management field and the banking field to Dublin. Some are going to Frankfurt, some are going to Paris, and um, uh, Amsterdam has been mentioned as well. I would just add, and uh, Christian is more expert in this matter than I, but equivalents uh, can be granted, but it's a at, at the discretion of the European uh, Commission or European institutions. It, it can be granted and it can be withdrawn. Uh, if, there's, if they're not satisfied, uh, that it is genuinely uh, equivalent. Uh, so I, I see, uh, I, I think that the initially, probably, uh, more equivalents will be granted than may ultimately be the case, because the more that the UK decides that it's going to diverge from the EU, and of course the whole point of Brexit is to diverge, well, the more divergence there is by the UK, the less equivalence will be granted to the UK in whatever sector it happens to be. Uh, and that, so in that sense, in, in the Brexit process is not going to be over on the 31st of December. It, it will be a process that will go in whatever direction is chosen by the UK authorities over several years to come. And the EU for its part, will be responding to that. Okay, I see. John, I just want to zoom out a bit, or rather, I want to zoom in on the, on the United States. Um, you have a, a, a long-standing special insight into the relationship between the US and Europe. Um, and of course, um, we have an incoming president, president-elect, who is an Atlanticist, who is, um, you know, has a, has a cultural uh, affinity with Ireland. Um, just how do you see how do you see the Biden administration's um, relationship with Europe taking shape? What do you expect to see more or less of under Biden? I, I think there there is going to be a considerable difference in style between the Biden administration and Trump administration. Um, President Trump's motto was "Make America Great Again, America First. And basically, not taking a lot of interest in or putting much value upon alliances. Uh, and this is surprising in a way because the United States, unlike its principal rival, China, has lots of allies. China has no allies at all. It doesn't, it hasn't entered into any alliances, whereas the United States has a surface of allies in the Pacific and in Western Europe. But President Trump took the view that. Uh, it was America first, and alliances weren't really all that necessary, uh, or the Allies weren't contributing enough uh, and ought to be told off for that. Now, I think with President Biden coming in, while in substance the policy being pursued by the United States may not be all that different, the United States under Biden will be still competing very much with China. It will be still looking for European members of NATO to pay more for their own defence. Uh, it will still be insisting on various things that the United States has always insisted upon, but it will be doing it in a different way. It will be doing it through multilateral, multilateral institutions like NATO, like the World Health Organization, like the World Trade Organization. Um, and I think that, that difference in style will be an opportunity for those who identify with the United States, and most of people in the European Union do identify with the United States, to have a, a more cooperative relationship with the United States. But it is important to recognize that President Trump obtained all the votes he got because he was saying things that made sense to Americans. And 
President Biden is going to have to take account of those Americans and their skepticism uh, about US allies uh, to a certain degree, but in a different way to President Trump. So President Trump openly undermined the European Union and he, he openly praised the Brexit project. Um, Biden, one assumes, is going to be a bit more circumspect. Do you think that Biden I, being well, in charge I mean, launches the UK into a deal? Well, but President-elect Biden was a member of the Obama administration, as the most second most senior member of it, and the Obama administration indicated very strongly that it did not favour Brexit, uh, that it believes in the value to the uh, to the United States of having uh, a single market in Europe, which of course has been very beneficial to, beneficial to American firms. So imagine there would be far less American economic activity and profit being made in Europe if there were 27 different markets with 27 different sets of regulations that every US firm had to comply with separately at great cost to itself. The very existence of a single European market saves a lot of money for American firms investing in Europe. Uh, and President Obama saw that. I think uh, President Trump didn't appreciate the value of that. He, he on the other hand, saw something in the Brexit project, the sort of Britain first idea that underlay Brexit, as an echo of the America first idea that underlay his political project. And he identified emotionally, I think, to some extent with Brexit. It wasn't so much a rational economic calculation as an emotional identification uh, with Brexit. That will be absent in a Biden-led administration. But there are underlying differences of, of opinion, whether it be about Boeing uh, Airbus or about uh, chlorinated chicken or GMOs or all of those other issues upon which there have been differences, uh, with which I'm all too familiar between the United States and the European Union, they'll all still be there, whether you have a Biden administration or a Trump administration. And Europeans need to realize that. So who, uh, actually, Christian, I'll ask you this, who, who will the Americans talk to primarily? Because Britain has been, the UK has been a, has been a sort of first port of call for the United States on, on, um, on lots of Europe-related issues. And obviously, um, Boris Johnson was the first European leader who Biden called after he was pronounced the winner of the election. So where will he, who will be his first call after January the 1st? Well, I think President Trump's first call was Saudi Arabia uh, when he took office. So I don't know who President Biden's first call will be. It could be an equally idiosyncratic choice. I don't think it signifies very much. I think it depends on if it's EU business, he should talk to the European Commission. If it's national business, if it's security business, he should talk to whichever country it is he's most directly concerned with, Germany or France. And obviously, Britain will continue to be a close ally of the United States through NATO. And a lot of the work will continue to be done through NATO um, by the EU members and the non-EU members, including Britain, of NATO. So I don't think there's going to be a choice, I imagine, um, President Biden will be very active using all of these channels of influence and talking to everybody. Christian, what do you, how do you think about this? Because just being, being blunt, there is a perception that the two poles are kind no, of no, like Germany and France. I, I very much agree. I mean, it's, uh, the, the, we'll, we'll see how uh, um, personal uh, relationships are uh, build up uh, over time, but to uh, underline one of the things that John said of, about uh, the the importance uh, for the Americans of the of the single market and of uh, of the EU in general, uh, one good example is the the legal field. Today, for instance, and I, I sorry to take another uh, again uh, an example in finance, but uh, all, most of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, agreements uh, in, in in derivatives, for instance, are be done uh, under British law. And uh, if there is one day uh, 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 a difference, and the, the, that goes to court, any decision by uh, a British court uh, is applicable in all the EU. So that was fine. 
Now, this, this will disappear on the 31st of December. And then uh, the, the association of dealers uh, in the, 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 the ISDA has immediately thought that <clears throat> one could not continue uh, for long with using British law. Uh, and uh, uh, because if you want to, uh, to have the execution of a decision by a British court in the future you, uh, without the UK, it means that you need an exequatur in each country which is cumbersome uh, and very uncertain process, uh, extraordinarily expensive, dangerous. So the ISDA decided to work on new contracts and they have actually, uh, it's, it's just uh, uh, by chance, but they decided for two new contracts, one in, under French law and one under Irish law. So that, that are the two uh, alternatives that are offered to uh, um, uh, to, to all the financial uh, uh, actors today. Uh, but it's it's really important that uh, everybody understands they have to move, because if they don't move, uh, they will have problems uh, the day that there is a, uh, an issue about the execution of one of the, of the contracts. And that's... Uh, uh, but it's taking the French uh, or, the, or the Irish contract then will enable to have execution throughout the EU uh, and, and then it solves the problem. You don't need to do anything in, in all the other countries. And that's that's great. Got it. So can I, if I can just ask you a simple, a really simple question, quite a simple, a quick question, but not a simple one from the audience. Um, a US trade free trade agreement with Europe on one hand, with the UK on the other hand, are either of those or both of those possible within the time frame that Biden has, so within the Biden administration's time frame? Christian, do you think that it's literally feasible to achieve those things? Um, well, it, it might be possible. So, so, uh, a free trade agreement is always something that takes long. Uh, we had started to negotiate, so the EU had started to negotiate with the uh, US. I mean, John Bruton must know that much better than I do. Uh, it was stopped eventually, and uh, uh, but when we take the example of Canada, for instance, I think it took seven years to negotiate, and Canada was a very easy case for the EU, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it was even even worse for Korea, for in South Korea. So it's 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 a difficult issue, uh, but at least I mean, if there is a common will to uh, in first implement uh, seriously WTO rules, make it work, and second, uh, try to find uh, a few areas where you facilitate uh, uh, a trade, or you can always, I mean, reduce some uh, uh, custom duties in some fields by a bilateral agreement inside the WTO universe, uh, you're not obliged to, to, to seek uh, for uh, a global a comprehensive agreement. You can make progress uh, in, in several areas and uh, to the benefit of, of, uh, of uh, both parties. Okay, John, you, I mean, you mentioned that good old example of chlorinated chicken, um, which is often seen as a barrier to one small barrier to trade. Do you think it's possible to get a, a trade agreement between the various blocks? Well, I think the UK and the United States will probably make some type of agreement, but I think its main import will be political rather than actual trade. I think the United States will recognise the need to reassure the United Kingdom that notwithstanding Brexit, and the United Kingdom is held in high esteem in Washington and is a partner. And there may be some sort of framework agreement that will be put together that will reassure public opinion uh, in Britain that their interests will be listened to. But I doubt if there will be a substantial trade agreement uh, that deals with all of the very difficult issues um, that, that I've mentioned uh, already. Um, we in the European Union, uh, I suppose the European Union is 
a more attractive market for the United States uh, than the UK on its own could ever be. We've had difficulty getting an agreement because, uh, number one, Congress is quite reluctant to make far-reaching trade agreements. Uh, Congress sees trade agreements as, in a sense, uh, a diminution of United States sovereignty if it enters into an agreement which trammels what the United States can do in its own jurisdiction. That's not very welcome to U.S. public opinion. Uh, and I, 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 do, I don't think that a Democratic-led administration is going to be a very adventurous in the trade field. Um, I think if perhaps we can agree something on the appellate court of the WTO and get that working again so that the WTO starts to work again, as it yeah. should, that might be the height of our, our ambitions. I don't think we're going to see a comprehensive agreement between the yeah. EU and the United States uh, in the next four years. That makes sense. That's very clear. So, we, with, the, with a few minutes we've got left, one thing that I did want to ask you, you talked about sovereignty, which I think is important. Um, and that being an Anglo-Saxon obsession, which I think is probably true. Um, but there is a, there's a phrase that keeps coming up whenever, you know, whenever we hear European policymakers talk about, and I'm curious to know how you translate it for, for our audience and for businesses who are looking at this, and that's strategic autonomy. And this is a phrase that keeps cropping up. The Council said that it was a, a key objective of the European Union in October, and uh, Macron has said that this is something France has been pushing for years. I have to admit, I don't really know what it means, but it sounds a bit like sovereignty. Um, and some people hear it as being a, a kind of fusion of protectionism and self-sufficiency and lots of other things. Can you help us understand what this phrase means? It sounds like it's going to be important for the next several years of uh, Europe's development. I think it's rhetoric rather than anything substantial. I don't think it has any particular uh, meaning. Um, the European uh, Union clearly has interests beyond the borders of the European Union. And to the extent that we work together, we can advance those interests together uh, autonomously. But no country is completely autonomous in the modern world, even the United States. It, it depends on allies, it depends on arrangements. And uh, I think the idea that the EU would ever be completely autonomous is, is a myth. Uh, what we do need, however, is greater internal unity. And I think that's what we have to continue to work upon. I think we've made a big step forward in agreeing to give the European Union the capacity to borrow, uh, to deal with the aftermath of COVID-19 in our economies. Uh, and I think that's potentially a very big step forward. But even that issue is now being delayed by objections in Poland and Hungary. So. We see that just as in the United States, it's very hard to change the US Constitution. In the European Union, it's sometimes very hard to make big decisions too. Um, but that's like, that's politics. You just do the best you can. Indeed. Every day Christian, and every day. Hey, Christian, in the spirit of going straight to the source, um, this, the strategic autonomy is a French speci specialism or French invention. What, what is it? Uh, no, I, 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 I do agree with what John just said. I, I think that if you, if you refer to a, a domain like security, uh, they, the, the feeling in France, I mean, is that we need, of course, to rely on a very strong alliance with the US. It's a unique partner in terms of uh, counterterrorism and security in general. The UK also, by the way. Uh, but uh, we we see clearly that the U.S. want the Europeans to spend more and want themselves to be less um, committed uh, with troops in Europe. So we believe that if, if to respond to that willingness expressed by the U.S., we need to organize ourselves and to have something of a strategic view and more engagement into security where we, we feel uh, we were followed by the UK, by the way, with that idea of the UK that they didn't want to share any parcel of sovereignty, but, but they were ready to uh, at least be active. It's more difficult with some other uh, important, uh, I mean, relatively big countries in, in Europe for historical reasons that we fully understand, but we think we need to move and to get some autonomy 
which means uh, to be committed to do more in that field. Um, and, and, that's, and, and there are other examples like that. So we, we don't want, we, do, we, do, we believe that Europe should not be simply uh, checking the rules and, and, uh, and uh, waiting uh, to be uh, uh, under the umbrella of the US. We need to be a partner and a partner needs to organize and do the uh, spending that, uh, that the other one is, is, is uh, calling for and, and organize itself in a more um, comprehensive way uh, so, that, so, that we, so that we that we partner uh, and not just a collection of small individual uh, 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 satellites. Got it. Well, we look forward to seeing how that pans out. Yvonne, if you're there, I'm going to hand back to you. But first, I'm going to thank you both very much for your time and your insights. It's fantastic to have you join us. And we wish all the best, of course, to Mr. Barnier's team. We will all be helping his team and uh, productive in the next few days. Yes. Yeah, thank you, um, to, uh, John, for the interview. And thank you, Christian and, and um, uh, John, for, for sharing your insights. It's a, it's a pity that um, Stefan had to run to the um, to get a test, but um, those are the realities today. I'm sure we will do another program with him uh, very soon, because we will need to update again on, on Brexit. The, uh, um, this concludes today's webinar. And a quick reminder, we will make a list of the attendees available after the event. And if you're a member of the EACC and you would like to connect to any of the participants, we will be happy to facilitate that. With that, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.